It is 6.30. I'd like to bring the Monday, December 5th meeting of the Manchester Select Board to order. Uh, roll call vote. John Round. Here. Brian Salisi. Here. Kathy Bellotta. Here. Ann Harrison. Here. Becky <coughs> Jakes. You got a full compliment. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> on being out with the living again. <laughs> Thank you. At least among the vertical, not yeah. horizontal. Um, so are there any public comments on non-agenda items from anybody in attendance? Um, limiting the time to two minutes, please. Sarah Mellish. Sarah Mellish. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, I just have a comment. I was disappointed that I could not find a meeting packet on the website um, for tonight. The last one I could find was from November 7th. Okay, thank you. That's very unusual because Debbie usually gets them online. Um, is there anything we can do to assist Sarah this evening? Can we forward oh, her? I can forward the... Okay, Sarah. Okay, thanks. I wanted to see the assessor information. Yep. All right. Okay. Uh, moving right along, I have no report at the moment. because I've not been out and about. Um, but thank you to John Round and Ann Harrison, who represented the the select board at the friendship tree lighting yesterday. Thank you. And well attended, you all said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very well attended. Yep. Very disappointed not to be there. All right. Tax classification hearing. I moved to open the hearing on tax classification for the town register. Second. Okay. Moved by Ann Harrison, seconded. By Kathy Bellotta, roll we'll call vote. Ann Harrison? Yes. Kathy Bellotta? Yes. Brian Solisey? Yes. John Round? Yes. And Becky <coughs> says yes. Okay, here we go. Good evening. My name is Michelle Granta Forty. I'm the principal assessor for the town of Manchester. And tonight we have with us uh, two board members of the Board of Assessors. We have Jeff McAvoy. And we have Rob Beatty. Thank you. Uh, the purpose of the classification hearing is for the select board to determine the allocation of the local property tax to be borne by the four classes of real property and class five personal property for fiscal year 2023. In deciding the allocation, the select board must adopt the residential factor. The residential factor is used to determine the percentage of the tax levy that is applied to each class of real and personal property. The Board of Assessors applies these percentages to the individual property classes according to Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 56. The select board must vote on the following in order to establish a tax rate. Number one, the classification, also known as shift of tax rate. Number two is a residential exemption. Number three is a small commercial exemption. And number four is open space discount. It is the responsibility of the assessors to provide the select board with relevant information and to discuss the fiscal effects of possible alternatives. So some Salient facts about fiscal year 2023. Um, every five years, the Department of Revenue closely audits the assessor's department, and that is called a certification year. The next certification year will take place in fiscal year 2026. All of the fiscal years in between are called interim years. Fiscal year 23 was an interim year. So changes to valuation and the tables in those years are done um, through the interim year program. Uh, new growth 
Growth in the single family sector increased slightly from last year due to an increased number of building permits. New growth in commercial class decreased from previous years as we did not have any significant activity. Personal property new growth increased slightly due to some second homes that were added to the tax base and to the utility appraisals that are now mandated by the state every year. You can see on the presentation a breakdown of new growth for fiscal year 23. The overall amount was 214719 85% of that came from the residential sector and 15% from commercial, industrial, and personal property. Underneath that, there's a history dating back to 2017 of new growth amounts, just to give you an idea of what the town um, saw in past years. The total taxable value for fiscal year 2023 is 2,969,576,887 with 93.8% of that in the residential um, sector and 6.2% commercial, industrial, and personal property. The tax levy limit calculation is below, and that is the fiscal year 22 levy limit, to which we add 2.5% increase plus new growth and... Um, any debt exclusions, we don't have any overrides, which bring us to the maximum permitted levy of 31,811,007, where the actual fiscal 20, uh, 23 property tax levy is $30,972,686.92 which gives us an excess or unused levy capacity of $838,320.08. The tax rate is the tax levy divided by the town's taxable valuation. This is known as the uniform or single tax rate. Under this rate, each class of property pays a share of the tax levy equal to its share of the total town value. The tax rate, rate used in this report is the projected fiscal year 23 tax rate of $10.43 per thousand, while keeping in mind that this tax rate is pending the Department of Revenue's approval. So the first item um, that we have to review is the classification. The select board may shift the town's tax burden from the residential class to the commercial, industrial, and personal property classes, as long as the shift does not exceed the minimum residential factor. This means the burden cannot be shifted more than 50%. And we have some worksheets in the second part of the presentation which will explain the shift and, and the effects of such shift. The second item is the residential exemption. The, res the select board may adopt an exemption of up to 35% to shift the tax burden within the residential class from owners of moderately valued residential properties that are the principal residence of a taxpayer to higher assessed properties and properties that are not the principal residence of a taxpayer. This is not an actual exemption, but it is a shift of residential taxes to non owner-occupied property owners. This exemption was originally adopted by several Cape Cod communities as a means of forcing summer residents to pay a higher share of the tax levy than would year-round residents. Cities such as Cambridge, Somerville, and Boston have adopted the residential exemption because they have a significant amount of non-owner-occupied multifamily properties such as apartment complexes. Since most <laughs> residential property owners in this community consider Manchester by the Sea to be their principal residence, adoption of the residential exemption would only serve owners who are assessed value is um, under the average of 1.283 million. Oh, to a, 
under. Under. It would hit those over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it would hit those, exactly. It would hit those over. Do not such an extent in a community where a large majority of the residential properties are owned or occupied, it places an unjustified additional burden to those other residences. And the scenario is listed under the worksheet in the second part of the presentation. Small commercial exemption. This exemption is similar to the residential exemption above. The exemption is beneficial to communities for the high presence of large commercial properties because it shifts the burden within a commercial class from small businesses valued under a million dollars with an average, with an annual average of 10 or less employees during the previous calendar year to larger ones and to parcels in the industrial class. In order for a commercial parcel to qualify, every business occupying the parcel must also qualify for the exemption. Since most businesses in Manchester by the sea are small, we would not see a relief in taxes. We would see an additional tax burden to larger commercial and industrial properties. Um, some examples of communities who have adopted this exemption are Avon, Braintree, Somerset, and Westford. Assessors may determine annual employment from a sole proprietorship or partnership. For all other businesses, they must rely solely on the determination of the Director of Labor and Workplace Development. An annual application process is required confirming payroll information. And we have a scenario explained under worksheets. And the last item for tonight is the open space discount. This discount may reduce the amount of the tax levy paid by the open space class to no less than 75% of its full and fair cash share of the levy, which means that they allow a discount of up to 25%. The select board by an annual vote may allow for a discount for all class two open space properties. Adopting an open space discount lowers the open space tax rate because of the amount, because the amount of the levy paid by the class is reduced. Those taxes are shifted to the residential class alone, which means a higher residential tax rate. Of the 351 communities, 19 classify property as open space, mostly in the western part of the state, uh, Ashland, Bedford, Berlin, Beverly, and um, and some others. In conclusion, historically, Manchester by the Sea has retained a uniform rate with a residential factor of one. At the end of the presentation, the select board would have to vote on those four items and sign the LA-5, which will be uploaded into the DOR's gateway system tomorrow morning as part of the tax rate setting process. Um, the next page has some information for fiscal year 23 compared to fiscal 22. Um, average residential value is 1.283 this year, up from 1.239 last year. Um, the average single family is 1.4 million this year. It was 1.334 last year. Um, based on the calculations above, the increase from last year to this year, based on the average residential assessment of $1.283 million, taxes are going up $247.40, with a tax rate decrease around 1.6%, from $10.60 to $10.43 per thousand. The next page is a list of terminology, just for your own information. And if you turn to page nine, we're going to go through the worksheets. And you will see on um, the, first, the first page with the pie graphs, the tax levy broken down by class or sector. So you see residential. 93.8183%, commercial 3.6149, industrial 
1919 and personal property 2.374%. If you turn to the next page, this is the first shift scenario. If we were to shift the rate from residential to commercial, industrial, and personal property, you can see the rate at the very top under 100%, $10.43. We're shifting the rate 10%, 20%, 40%, and 50%. You can see the tax rate going down to $10.36, $10.29, $16, $10.09. Meanwhile, the commercial, industrial, and person, personal property rates are going up from 1043 to 1147, 1252, 1460. Underneath that, you can see the difference in the tax levy decreasing for residential by $195,020. If we were to shift by 20%, decreasing by $390,040. If you go further down, you can see the increase for commercial, industrial, and personal property going up at a shift of 10%, uh, 10%, 111,000, 20%, 224,000. Where you really see the difference is on the next page. So worksheet on page number 11, at the top, as the rate is shifting 10%, the average uh, residential property would see a reduction of $89.87. But the increase to the commercial, uh, commercial and industrial class would be $870.86. And if you look at the mi uh, maximum shift of 50% under residential, the reduction would be $436.52, but the increase on the average commercial property would be $4,371.06. And that's, that's a big burden to put on small businesses in town. Um, the, next, the next worksheet is regarding the residential exemption. Um, the maximum exemption is 35% and it's a set amount. So it's 35% of the average residential property, not 35% of each assessed mm -hmm. property. So the maximum is $449,356. Uh, $449, um, so effectively the shift um, what it does is it shifts the residential tax burden to the top one-fourth in value of owner-occupied parcels and to non-owner-occupied rental units throughout the town. Because most of the properties are owner-occupied, we would actually see an increase in the tax rate for everybody. Um, it would not work in a town like Manchester because these exemptions were meant for uh, second homes, rental properties, apartments, that sort of thing, where owner-occupied properties are few and are mostly in larger cities. And the next worksheet is regarding small commercial exemption. So each year we receive a list from the state of properties of the town that uh, the Department of Revenue feels would qualify for a small exemption, small commercial exemption. The full and fair cash value of the, the properties that would qualify are $8,125,614. 10% exemption is $812,561 per parcel. So what that would do is it would increase the commercial tax rate from $10.43 to $10.51. So for a small um, business, 
let's say valued at 119,000, it would be a $107 reduction in the, in the taxes. Um, but if we were to look at a larger property, 3.9 million, it would increase taxes by 312,000. Historically, Manchester by the Sea has not adopted this exemption. And the last page, the last um, page of the packet is the open space discount. We currently do not have any property classified as open space. This is not applicable. If we did classify land as open space, it would grant an exemption percentage voted on by the select board each year, not to exceed 25%, thus shifting the tax burden onto the rest of the residential properties in town. Adopting an open space discount lowers the open space tax rate because the amount of the levy paid by the class is reduced. Those taxes are shifted to the residential class alone, which means the residential tax rate would increase. And that is the presentation. Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Very thorough. Thank you all. Um, John Round, any questions? A lot of numbers here. Uh, question. <laughs> this form LA 13 for new growth. Yes. That that what does that drive? That drives the total valuation or the, the, so the increase in valuation, or what does that drive? The LA 13 is a list of the new growth valuation using last year's tax rate. <laughs> and then putting a value onto that uh, particular sector. So when you look at a new growth, you see, I actually have that with me. If you'd like to take a look at it. Um, it's a breakdown of new growth by class. Oh, okay. Individual. I mean, there's an increase in valuations here, and that's largely driven by... The increase what? in valuations are due to sales. Well, that's purely driven by driven so by and, so two, and two different. Yeah, these are two different and building two different reasons, two different buckets. Right. So you've got new growth, which is new construction. Okay, all right. That's that, that's the confusion. So we had we had about twenty million dollars worth of new construction. Right. Okay. And that yielded two hundred fourteen thousand right. dollars. So in making an assumption taxes. next year it's going to be X or something. Right. Right. This was a little higher than what we had estimated when we put the budget together. And then the other assumption for increase in valuations is based purely on sales? Right. Okay. Yeah, and if you look under the terminology page on the presentation, it explains new growth subject to taxation for the first time. Perfect. New articles of personal property, previously mm -hmm. exempt property. Which page is that? Um, Which page is that? This is page eight. Okay. Uh, tax as a separate parcel for the first time, such as subdivisions, condo conversions. Um, yep. It's an increase in assessed valuation over prior year due to construction activity, but not due to a revaluation program. Okay. So that's the difference. So overall, the total, total valuation of the town went up a little, right around 5%. Mm -hmm. But almost a percent of that was new growth. Right. So so um, you take that away, subtract that out, so values went up about 4% based on sales, based on sales data. And we were aiming for a 2.5% increase in taxation. But if properties go up 4%, more, so the, the, the rate actually drops. Down, so that's why you see the rate but dropping. But your values are higher, so your taxes are still going Right. Okay. Exactly. So taxation is a, is a yeah. function of value times rate. So the rate went down about one and one point six percent. Values went up right around I'm rounding four percent, which yields that out of your pocket another two and a half percent. Assuming it stays at two and a half. Right. <coughs> Brian. Not just the uh, the new growth that was based on permits. How do we uh, assess yeah. the value from permits? permits. <coughs> so whoever. Well, it's, it's actual construction. Right. right. Yeah. So, but yes, yeah, so obviously it stems from permits. Something that has not been taxed before. Right. But as far as the value of the uh, the property is determined by the sales. 
Okay. Still sales. Yep. For residential. For commercial, we have to go by income and expense forms, leases, rents, uh, mm -hmm. different okay. type of valuation. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Anne? Um, the uh, increase in valuation from sales is just overall sales prices were up 4% without considering different types of, of overall, categories of real estate. Overall, All the increase was for the town 4.7%, so oh, rounding okay. off okay. to 5%. I do have a breakdown of increases, so I can just give you some examples. Um, so single family homes were up 5%. Condominiums were up 3%. Two family homes were up 7%. Three family homes were up 10%. Um, and so, then we just have some small outbuildings like warehouses and things like that. So uh, according to the classification that we use for all of the different properties, we have different... Uh, so, so a three-family house would... Okay. Yeah, so a three-family three house went up 10%. You, yes, you would increase its value. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Just a quick follow-up question to me. So what, what's the end number for sales? This is not a big town. Um, how many how many sales were involved in two thousand? Uh, how many sales were involved? So we have non arms length transactions and we have arms length transactions. I don't have the complex. breakdown in front of me. <laughs> I'm going to say we had about sixty five okay. arms length transactions, and the rest were all either estate sales or you know, something to do with divorce, uh, private sales, that sort of thing. Any more questions? Is the board ready to vote? I move that we accept the recommendation of the Board of Assessors and set the residential at one. We have a second. Second. Okay, moved by Ann Harrison, seconded by John Roundroll. Call vote Ann Harrison. Yes. Kathy Bellotta. Yes. Ryan Solacy. Yes. John Round. Yes. And Becky Jake says yes. Thank you all very much. No, we're not well, done. Yeah. We're not done yet. We're not done. I move that we Thank you. <laughs> accept, <laughs> accept the recommendation <laughs> of the Board of Assessors and decline to invoke the reg residential e exemption. Second. Moved by Ian Harrison, second Brian Solacy. Roll call vote John Round. Yes. Brian Solacy. Yes. Kathy Bellotta. Yes. Ian Harrison. Yes. Becky Jake says yes. And now we have the commercial, small commercial. I move that we decline to invoke the small commercial exemption. Second. Okay, moved by Ian Harrison, second Brian Solacy. Roll call vote Ian Harrison. Yes. Kathy Bellotta? Yes. Ryan Solacy? Yes. John Rao? Yes. And Becky Jake says yes. Do we have to go in an open space if we don't have any? Okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Okay. I, I move that we decline to take advantage of the open space discount. Second. <laughs> okay, moved by Ann Harrison, seconded by Kathy Bellotta. Roll call vote Ann Harrison. Yes. Kathy Bellotta? Yes. Ryan Solacy? Yes. John Rao? Yes. And Becky Jake says yes. Thank you very thank much. You. That was thank you. I thank will you leave much. the LA five with Gray, town administrator Gray. Okay. Thank you. Have a chance if you could sign. Yeah. Thank you. So we can do it. Do you want to we can do it tonight. Hard copy. We don't have to do it online. We have to upload it. Okay. We have right. to upload a copy of the signed document. Right. Oh, it was an enormous amount of work, and the fact that we didn't discuss it is a great compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, it was really, it was so easy to follow, clear, it was, uh, thank you. Thank you. I almost understood all of it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.
Okay. Next on the agenda, we have the um, alcohol. Good evening. Um, alcohol license renewals and seasonal population. Okay. Do you want to close the hearing? Close the hearing. Close the hearing. Oh, for Pete's sake. Okay. <coughs> yes. The tax rate. Second. Okay. Moved by Ann Harrison, second by Kathy Bellotta. Ann Harrison? Yes. Kathy Bellotta? Yes. Brian Solisey? Yes. John Round? Yes. And mm -hmm. Becky Jake says yes. Thank you, Debbie, very much. <coughs> Okie okay. dokie, then. Yes. What is seasonal population? Thank you. That was going to be my question. <laughs> <laughs> um. It's just the seasonal population from I can't remember what I don't have the form in front of me from it's, it's an estimate. It's an estimate. For what you think the summer population goes to. So the state does this every year. As part of their assessment of how many liquor licenses oh, you yes. should have. Okay. Based on population. Okay. So for towns that have a high, very high seasonal, yes. you will be paying for new licenses. Okay. Thank you. Which you don't. <laughs> so it's, it's it's not much of a factor for us, but okay. No, and I, I they leave here, they don't stay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there was one thing on that that I wanted to ask about. And in one note, it said that we were renewing annual licenses for 13 establishments, but three, six, count nine, <laughs> 10, 11, uh, 12, two to 13, no, one, two, two are not renewing. Okay. But the MAC, because they're going for a new license for a new owner, mm -hmm. and you still had a license for Foreign Affairs at 26 Central Street. Oh. So we got to get rid of that one. But, and we have 14 here, though. The 14 all together here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. 14, you're right. Okay. Okay. I just, so I did, I two. Just, yeah. just wanted so to make 14 sure that yeah, there's two right. that are not renewed. It's not a big deal. I my, just my didn't. No, no, no. I didn't. I didn't. No, if there was yep. <laughs> the ones you have are the ones that are getting renewed. Okay, perfect. <coughs> um, all right. Uh, do we have any questions on any of the licenses? John, Brian, Kathy Ann. Okay, and I have kind of one question. And it was that it, some of them, for example, um, at Singing Beach Club, since the seasonal closing, um, and some did, does that... I know we'll do the B and T later. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I did not see. They it. they usually do it in the spring. Okay. Um. But it it that just do they need to be sent? I mean, that's what do you mean? I don't recall seeing that before. Have they said yeah, that they, in the past? That yes. They, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All righty. Uh, we have a motion to approve. You, you have a question. It looks like Sarah Mellish. <clears throat> oh, sorry. S sorry, Sarah? this is a generic. This is a generic question. Is this Are as a only... as a member of the public? Yes. Sarah Are, Mellish. Are you only approving the alcohol licenses at this time, and the entertainment licenses are done separately? Correct. Yes, these are just alcohol. And when are the entertainment licenses done? They'll be coming along soon. They just got mailed out end okay. of November, beginning of December. So they're coming in. Because I have concerns about the American Legion entertainment license. I believe they went beyond the constraints of what it's allowed. What number Bennett are you, Sarah? Pardon? What number Bennett are you? Eleven. There you go. Thank you. Next to the big dig. <laughs> <laughs> to do more blasting 
next week. <coughs> Buckle up. <laughs> okay. Any other question? question? Yes. Yeah, so uh, is, I assume there's a differential between seasonal and full year licenses? Yes. I assume there's some. For the alcohol? For, for alcohol, yeah. Yeah, seasonals are from April 1st to January 15th. So they pay less? That, that's really my question, yeah. Yeah. That's, I think I it's know. slightly less. That's my memory. You can double check. Uh, it it yeah. must be something they're saying seasonal, and if it was costing the same amount, they just file for a regular. I think it's the same. I haven't seen any. Is it cheaper for a seasonal? I haven't seen any. I thought it was, but I can, we, okay. we can double check. Yeah. And do we First define round seasonal, round. or do they define seasonal? I'm just curious. The well, dates? Yeah. The state. Pardon the me? state does. Yeah. The st oh, the state does. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think on the applicate on the renewal form, it says that the premises are now open for business if not explained. So mm -hmm. if you're seasonal, you're not open now. So they have to explain. Right. You're not going to get. You're not going to see the seasonals now. Anyway, they'll come out in. We have March. We have to. That's true. Yeah, we have the yacht club and C yeah. and yeah. They're saying seasonal on here. Yeah. Oh. Singing beach from the yacht club. I saw it on Singing Beach, huh. and then the yacht club says, "Yeah, right here under." I think they do their federal federal ID, right? So the Castry Boys and the seasonal is separate, and I saw that these two were in there. Yeah. It says oh, closed. even in the license class at the. On the where they, the class. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, because this is all says annual. Singing beaches says annual. They they wrote seasonal. Right. They wrote annual, but then they say they're open seasonal. Yeah. <laughs> so that <laughs> they're going there. They have an annual license. That's mm -hmm. I because I yeah I thought in the past we just did annual. Yeah, annuals yeah. are in December. Yeah, seasonals will come out in March, which is what the bath and tennis does. Yeah. I mean, that's why mm -hmm. they've always been separate, or yeah. since I've been doing this. So the two that are in here are really annual. Uh, really annuals. Even though they're saying they're not open year round. Right, right, because so their class through. through the state is an annual license. Okay. That's why okay. I got them in that clarifies it. October. Okay, all right, so. <sighs> well, I think their seasons are more extended than the bath and tennis anyway. I don't so know if the state views it differently. I don't need to. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I mean, it's the application they've submitted, so. All right. So they're all annual. They're all annual. Yep. Um, may I have a motion to approve all the applications? Presented to us. Second. Okay. Moved by Ann Harrison. Second, Kathy Blotter. We'll call that John Round. Yes. Brian Solacy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Blotta. Yes. Ann Harrison. Yes. And Becky Jake says yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Next up, we have recall of the special act request. Um, um, do we need to approve oh, the wait. seasonal population? Seasonal, yes. Yes. Yeah. Move to approve the seasonal population increase estimation form as presented. Second. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Move Dan Harrison. Second, Kathy Blotter will call vote. Dan Harrison? Yes. Kathy Blotter? Yes. Brian Solacy? Yes. John Round? Yes. And Becky Jake says yes. Okay, thank you. So with the special act, um, we need to vote to ask our state legislators to sponsor a special act establishing a recall provision for locally elected officials as we have here. Did everybody get a chance to read it over and mm -hmm. verify the 
Greg, do we need to modify any of this, or is this exactly how it gets submitted? Uh, no, entirety. it should be submitted as, as is, yes. Okay. Is that's what the town meeting voted for. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean this, the, the, the copy that Liz... The true copy of test. All right. Um, anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Can I have a vote? I mean, um, motion, please. Um, to ask our. I move to ask our legislators um, to sponsor, to sponsor um, the article which was uh, presented as Article 3 in the town meeting as amended. And just if I might make a friendly addition to that, a recall provision for locally effect, elected officials. By all means. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, moved by Ann Harrison, seconded by Kathy Bellotta. Roll call vote. John Rounds? Yes. Ryan Solacy? Yes. Kathy Bellotta? Yes. Ann Harrison? Yes. And Becky Jake says yes. Pine Street Speed Zone. Okay. Is that what we have? All right. <coughs> um, Greg, do you want to? Sure. No, so we, this we, 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 we discussed um, the speeds on Pine Street, and in particular, <coughs> the length of the 20 mile per hour zone um, being longer. Than, um, than necessary. It is really designed as a special uh, speed zone, safety zone at the um, in and around the um, senior housing at Newport Park, uh, rather than as far up as it goes currently. And so um, the recommendation is that that speed zone be a quarter of a mile from the intersection of Bridge and uh, Bridge and Pine. Um, and Central that, and Bennett, <laughs> complicated in a second. So going a quarter mile up would be the length of the 20 mile per hour zone. So where does and that end? Where is a quarter mile? Does it end at like Pleasant Street or does it end? No, 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 no. It's, it's before, it's uh, near Woodhall. 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 Yeah. So yes. from it's basically Central to Woodhall. Basically from Central to Woodhall, yes. Yes, so just beyond the Newport Park entrance. So then the, um, the rest of the, so then what is currently a 20 mile from Woodholm up to Pleasant would be 25 and 25 would continue up um, just before you get to um, the highway. And then it becomes 35. So that's enough. That, that, thank you for clarifying. That's why my question regarding the information that was submitted. I wasn't sure if the police chief was also suggesting that we increase the speed limit from 25 to 35 on Upper Pine, where it's more um, rural. Keeping right it now it's 25 all the way till it gets to be 40 right before the highway. So the, the 35 mile per hour speed limit comment here was confusing to me. I thought it was 35 there. No, <laughs> it's 35 it's on School Street. 40. I'm up and down this thing every yeah, day, yeah. monthly. It's 35 on School Street. Gotcha. After the highway. Yes. And but on Pine Street, it's 40. It's so 40. I wasn't sure if he was recommending upping it from 25 to 35, or so I was confused. Um, I, I just quick question, Jim. Was your question about? Um, Something prior to this, or you um, hear about the Pine Street? Uh, my question would be about Pine Street. Okay, we'll come back to you then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think we were proposing any changes to In what's currently pine. on the okay. Upper Pine. Okay. This was just focused on that safety zone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
have we considered any uh, traffic calming? Uh, and that's a very wide road, right. and it could have a protected bike lane yep. and reduce yep. people's tendency to speak. Has, any, has that been considered? It, yes, it has been considered. It's, it's something sort of waiting for more formal discussion in, in, in the yay or nay on your part. So if you're interested in having that, then we can <clears throat> develop that a little further and present it yeah. to you. Yes, can, can, um, I'm glad you brought it up, Anne, because uh, there's been a lot of conversation around traffic calming, especially with the new Pine Street field going in and Upper Pine. <coughs> and when we had the conversation on September 7th around traffic on Pine, what we were specifically discussing was not necessarily sp just speeding, it was road rage and people driving on the wrong side of the road because the speed limit is too small for the width of the road. So options include narrowing the road, as Anna is suggesting, or increasing the speed limit. And when a, with a field going in, in Upper Pine, increasing the speed limit may not be the best option. Um, but I do think, given the field, there's a new factor that we did not really discuss in depth. We should have a serious discussion as soon as possible understanding the options and the cost. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we seem to come back to this discussion more than annually. Um, the speed, speed in general throughout town, um, but I think primarily on Pine, Pine Street. Um, and I know, like Kathy, I, I as well have I'm on that road daily, and if I'm doing the speed limit, I have people right on my tail, very unhappy, and they will zip around me and go by. Um, now, I, I when we when we um, have had Todd, is Todd on this? He has a class this evening, but but Mark uh, Mark McCoy. Mark's is on. Okay. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Because we did have um, somebody wrote in suggesting that we write more tickets. And I know we've gone back and forth with this with the police department as well. Um, but I, I think that, that we need to come up with some measures and actually implement and adhere. I think given that we have a, a field, go, field going in, yep. which is a practice field, so it's going to attract younger kids, mm -hmm. it would be strongly in everyone's interest to put in a bike lane, from, at least from the field to Central Street. The road is wide, level, paved. It's a question of painting and perhaps putting in some bollards. Yep. So I think the options should absolutely be looked at. I fully support some type of bike lane. Something to consider is that on Lower Pine, where I live, um, the residents rely on the parking. So, uh, mm -hmm. so we have parking so, and bike and road. Right. I'm just saying. Yeah. I absolutely support it. We just um, there's also the uh, balance of not losing parking spaces. Mm -hmm. um, which are at a premium, but I, I think a bike lane would be wonderful. If Boston can do it, <laughs> Little Manchester. Well, and even, to. But, but down at Lower Pine, it also shifts a little. Yes. So you, you're, you're coming at it in the road, it shifts. Um, after we talk, I'd like to hear from um, Bike Pad, who I'm sure has some really, a lot of very good insight. Um, and I know Jim Dietrich wants to say something, but um, so we'll go to the board first. Uh, Brian? Well, I understand the, uh, the bike lane. Uh, you know, my only concern was we only have road, one road to widen up our bike lane. So the bike goes when they end. Now they're both okay. Uh, but that's, you know, it's better than nothing, I suppose. Uh, I'm an advocate of, of raising the speed limit to five miles. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with the uh, when when the uh, time comes with the upper pine the uh, field. We'll look at it then, 
at this point, even if it's a 90 day trial, all it is is changing the signs. Um, and uh, we'll take a look at it. I just, I think that uh, it's 20 miles an hour is just painfully slow mm -hmm. on, on Pine Street. That's my feelings. John? So isn't there, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly interested in going from Pleasant up to this new ball field. Isn't there a bike lane on there already, northbound? Not an official bike lane. It's, it's a wide, it's a wide shoulder. It's a wide shoulder. <laughs> I mean, I'm on a bicycle on that right. all the time. And I know it's there, and I, I, I always thought it was just, it was a bike lane. Okay. So we, we have one, whatever, whatever has to, how, it, how it has to be redefined, we nevertheless have the space at least on one side of the road. I mean, if you had on one on either side, I think that's a problem in terms of the, the width of the road then for travel. But the, there is one on that. Um, what, what was the 85th percentile for speed? Did we look at that up in that upper part of Pine Street, or was it just on the lower part? Um, they do have that. I don't have that. In yeah, front I, of I, I don't know. I, I don't know if Mark has that. I, I am in favor of making that 25 miles an hour. Um, we can revisit that once a field's been put in there, but we all know the timelines kind of shift around. And, um, it is 25 up there. The it, 20, is, it's, it goes, it's 25 it starts by the proposed a little speed. past the cemetery, right. past Pleasant Street. Yeah. That's when it switches to 25. Just past the cemetery? Yep. Yeah. That once you get that four way stop. Okay. Yeah. Then it's 25 until you get to almost across from Rockwood Heights. And it goes. And then it goes to 40. I, I know where the 40 sign is. So the only 25 <laughs> thing we're talking about is really from just below Whitholm to, to uh, the, the cemetery. cemetery. Yeah. Whatever the story is. Yeah. Okay. I'm up and down that road four or five times a day. Yeah. I drive the same speed no matter what the story <laughs> is. And I will continue. <laughs> and it's not, what, it's not 20. <laughs> but yeah. I hadn't been behind you, Becky, yet. So, <laughs> um, but a I'm, lot of I'm, not happy people have. <laughs> well, it might be the bumper sticker. But, but, <laughs> and maybe yeah. that explains. I've never had anybody try and pass me, and I, it's not like I'm going 35 or 40 miles an hour. I'm not, but um, maybe I go fast enough that it doesn't antagonize people. No, I'm I'm doing 22. I just okay. So I think you're the, in a different category. I was only speaking about Upper Pine. I didn't. Um, make a comment about the proposal in front of us to increase the speed limit from 20 to 25 and, and that lower pine section, I do agree with that. Um, I do think it will cut down on the road rage yeah. and, um, and I think the goal here is to get the speed limits and the road width aligned. And then once we get those aligned, then if things are still not in good shape, then the, the enforcement should be stepped up. That's kind of where my head is at. But right now, the in my mind, the road width and the speed limits are not aligned. So stepping up enforcement is we have a one more thing to do before we, we do that. Well, and and <coughs> with everything, you know, there there is usually a lot more to how we got here. And um, complete streets came into play with this. Um, so why don't we, is it, are we okay to open a half mm -hmm. bike pet? All right. Good Mr. evening. Mr. Cowman. Terry Cowman. I'm not representing the bike pet this evening because we haven't had a vote on this material. <laughs> but some facts about Pine Street. Thank you. To be surf village, by the way. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Heard a lot of good Thank comments you. tonight. I think they're right on the mark. I appreciate your Thank you. involvement. Thank you, Terry. Seven tenths of a mile from Pleasant Street to the Bridge. So if we're talking about moving it 
quarter mile up to the stuff is even half a mile that would be reduced from or increased from 20 to 25, I guess, is the proposal. Um, wow. If we say 20, cars are currently doing 30. If we say 25, cars will do 35. It's just that sort of latitude and leeway in the current scenario. And as Kathy points out, the real issue is the street itself. It's wide, it's straight, it's in pretty good shape. There's extra room in the travel lanes for any kind of vehicle that are going to be coming up Pine Street. And ultimately, that has to be addressed. So it's the way the road is built, it encourages speed. Um, the entire link, that seven tenths of a mile, is one of the densest sections in Manchester. Because not only do you have Pine Street itself, which there are 67 driveways. How many? Oh, 67 wow. between Pleasant and uh, Bridge Street. There are also seven streets that enter Pine Street in that same seven tenths of a mile. So there are approximately 67 residences right on Pine Street. But if you go on any of the side streets, Wood Home, Etc., you'll find another 200 residences that empty onto Pine Street. That includes not only adults, but kids trying to get to school from that side of town. And bus service doesn't extend the full way. So they're with mom and dad or biking or walking to school. Um, if you include the area above um, Pleasant Street, go all the way up to Rockwood Heights in that area, you add another. 70 some odd residences, 75 that also empty onto Pine Street and would be coming into town on Pine Street too. Now, I'm not going to say that I drive 20 miles an hour on Pine Street. I try to keep it under 25. That's usually when I'm on a bike. I try to keep it under 25. <laughs> I'm usually successful, but it's downhill, so that means we kind of go a little faster sometimes. Um, so, I understand that there's that uh, kind of impetus for speed, particularly coming into town as we uh, exit 128. I think the real question for us is what kind of town are we interested in promoting? Are we interested in promoting vehicles and traffic uh, moving as quickly as possible? In this case, that sets up a certain sort of design prioritization. If we're interested in orienting ourselves towards pedestrians, uh, walkers, runners, cyclists, and so forth, and making the town not only safe, but sort of a healthy approach to uh, the citizenry, then we think about the priorities a little bit differently. And that's where calming devices come into play. And our DPW is very familiar with any kind of calming device that's out there. Raised surfaces at intersections, crosswalks, bollards, really narrowing the, the travel service on the road would, would be significant. And if you look at the handouts, you see really what's behind this whole thing. At 30 miles an hour, the uh, uh, fatality and serious injury risk, I've seen it as high as 50% in some surveys, but this one from Walk Boston, 40% severe injury or fatality at 30 miles an hour. And that's the speed cars are going at currently with the closest speed limit of 20. So if we bump it up another five, we're probably looking at 35 to 40. And now the accident rate, the severity, it's a 50-50 proposition, at least, and maybe even lower odds than that. The um, second handout shows what happens where most accidents, fatalities occur, and what speeds. And it's between 30 and 35 miles an hour which is exactly what we're kind of promoting here by increasing the speed limit from 20 to 25 miles an hour. So we're making the town more dangerous. And I think the order of priority here might be shifted towards looking at the street and then the road surface itself and figuring out how to calm traffic first and then kind of thinking of speed as a factor in relation to that. So that's my two cents. I have actually a comment, I think. Um, the last time we talked about this, Chuck Dam came up with some figure, Chuck and the, and the police chief. When the speed limit was 25, the um, 85th percentile was about 32. 
when the speed went to 20, the 85th percentile went to, went up two or three miles an hour. Right. So the lower speed limit did not make people go slower. Right. And, uh, and, and that's what has brought this to our attention again. Yes. And there's a few issues there. Um, enforcement, certainly one of them. There's almost no enforcement of the current speed limit. And I think our police will tell you they don't really bother ticketing or stopping someone until they ex exceed the speed limit by 10 miles an hour. So that means <clears> that <throat> now, why does it go up instead of down? Um, I really don't know the psychology of the whole thing, but I, I know the road itself encourages that kind of speed. So is, is it people are like that and pissed off and they're trying to make a point? I Could think be. people are really, I'm sorry to go kind of back and forth for you, but Becky, I think people are, see the, the 20 mile an hour speed limit is unreasonable mm -hmm. and, and just ignore it completely, whereas we may hope that a 25 mile an hour speed limit would seem <coughs> annoying but rational um, and, and might miss. I agree with that. It, it, it could be that way, but I think generally speaking, not specific to Pine Street, if, if you look at what happens when the speed limit goes up, people exceed it by about 10 miles an hour. So we're looking at 32, 33, 34, 35, and that's where we enter that danger zone mm -hmm. of accident. So through a combination of enforcement, education, and maybe a little bit of uh, you know, reward type behavior, along with road design, that would really address the issue, and I think that's really where we got ahead longer term. So I've got a, a question with the, with the data, and I, I recall them discussing that data a year ago or something like that. Did they look at the individual points? I'm just wondering about the distribution of speed, because road rage becomes a bigger deal when you've got 20 miles an hour, and if you've got some cars that are now going 40 because they're trying to get around somebody and there are more people going 40 to try and get around somebody that get recorded as that so there aren't very many cars but the few cars that are are doing at a faster rate the whole average looks like it's going up but really it's just a few cars that i'm not following becky anymore <laughs> i'm going to drive around her. and yeah. and that might be that might be what's contributing to that and well we have um, going up Mark McCoy and Jim, go ahead and mute yourself. I'll come back to you. Um, but if you'd go ahead and mute yourself for the time being, that'd be great. Um, Mark, do you have any comments? Uh, <clears throat> Mark McCoy from our local constabulary. I think our, um, I stated earlier, the average speed limit for the uh, speed study we did back in January of 2021, the average speed was 32 miles an hour, and the 85th percentile was 37 miles an hour. Um, our, there's been no accidents to speak of in that area, but definitely our road rage incidents have been higher. There's been more reported road rage incidents. In addition, um, I'm wondering, um, Mark, if you on on that on on Pine Street, um, yeah. <coughs> if there are is any uh, are there more more um, stops, citations, warnings on Pine Street than there are on other streets? Um, our traffic enforcement townwide has been on an increase, our arrests are up, um, our OUIs are up, and that all comes back to our traffic enforcement. There has been a significant increase in traffic enforcement on Pine Street. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Let me just add one more point. We've all experienced in the pandemic, and this is true both locally and nationally, that speeds are up. When the density of traffic reduced during the pandemic, people started driving faster, and the incidents of road rage have increased on every highway in the country, including our own town streets, as a result of you know, the last couple, three years of lockdown. So any statistics that we look at for speed at this point in time have to kind of take into account the uh, social aspect of the last couple, three years. So.
Well, and one one last thing I'd, I'd like to say is, okay, so we, we established a speed limit of 20. And so now because people are going even faster and they don't like it, so now we say, okay, well, let's up the speed limit a little bit and see if they like that. I'm, I'm not convinced that that is the right tact. However, um, I'm one of all. And so if more people feel that it's a, a better option, I think, to look at um, potentially increasing the speed, that's one thing. But I, I do... Um, I do really like the idea of looking at, as has been laid out here, do we, do we reduce the width of the travel lane? Do we look at bike lanes? Do we ask our DPW to come in with, again with some very... Some yeah, I, can I make a suggestion? Um, I think we've discussed a lot of different <coughs> options here. Um, I do think there's a difference between upper pine and lower pine. Um, in terms of density, in terms of proposed solutions, they could be the same, they could be different. Um, I would like the DPW to come back here with a comprehensive set of options for safety, which can include, not limit, we don't want to limit their creativity, <laughs> yep. right? But it could include a bike lane, there's, there's room for it. And I believe Anne used the word protected yeah, bike lane as opposed yeah. to just the little white lines that were in the road, right? A protected bike lane yeah. um, and whatever other good traffic calming measures um, they can um, come up with, with the goal of the width of the roll being appropriate for a posted speed limit. And their, mm -hmm. their, their options should include changing the speed limits. Um, so that things match. Right now, things don't match. Exactly. And I don't know how long that will take, but I hope it's not long. Huh. Um, and in the meantime, I am wondering if we can um, move forward with the chief's recommendation of just in that one small section of lower pine, changing it to 25 because we're not going to be implementing any type of protected bike lane in the next few weeks. Um, so... Personally, I'd like yeah. to move forward with that piece. And just to another on. comment on that. I don't know how many of you, if I'm driving, I, when I'm coming down Pine Street, I'm not looking at my speedometer. Okay? I'm going where I think is a safe speed. Mm -hmm. And invariably, when I do look down, it's 24 to 26 miles an hour. Okay? And I think that that, because that's what seems to be proper for that area. So I think to raise it to 25, and, and also at the same time, do it you know concurrently and, and look at other options. I don't think there's any reason to delay the, the, the raising of the speed limit for the, for the chief's uh, recommendation. And I, I, I would add the last suggestion he, he makes here, which is a good one, is then do a speed study. Right. Put that up there. Let's find out what's going on. Right. So I, I, I'm kind of like uh, Brian is to a certain extent. I'm not paying attention. I feel what the right speed is. Mm -hmm. For me, well, it's a little higher. It's around 30, 29, 30, okay? Right. And that's what I go pretty much without even looking. That's just... I'm going to drive out of town yeah. because I'll get out of town three minutes earlier. <laughs> I guess so. But um, he should uh, put up some sort of a some sort of a monitoring system because I'm curious what the story is. Okay, we're all curious whether that's going to make a difference. Okay. Um, yep, go ahead. Um... I understand that it is the police policy not to stop people who are doing less than 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. And I understand that that's based on courts throwing out cases, but we don't go to court. We give warnings. We stop people. But if we, if we use a fixed 10 miles per hour rather than, say, 20% of the speed limit, <coughs> then we are letting people go 30 in a 20 exactly. zone yeah. and 35 in a 25 zone. And I understand that this is uniform police policy in the state, but I think maybe we ought to look at the problem from our point of view rather than everybody else. There's, a, there's standards and there are pragmatic implementation of standards. and. We are a small town, as we often like to say, and, and 
standards need to be adapted to, to work well, I think, in, in a town like this. Well, okay to open up to public comment. Okay, um, Jim Dietrich, go ahead and put your hand down and unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as Thank some you of you for may being know, so patient. Say again. Thank you for being so patient, Jim. Patience uh, comes with being on the zoning board. Address, um, please. <laughs> As uh, some of you may know, prior to the state giving us permission <coughs> to raise speed limits, um, I delivered to, to the select board, I think prior to the pandemic, let me kill that, thank you. I delivered to the select board a petition of all the people who live on Lower Pine Street asking that the speed limit be increased or decreased to um, 30, 25 to 30 miles an hour. Um, I don't know who still may remember that, but that was the consensus of opinion of the people living there because there are a lot of children and a lot of bicycles. And um, 20 miles an hour is probably too low. However, the enforcement on the part of our police department is terrible. They do not enforce large vehicles early in the morning. You never see them out there. Uh, the trucks that are coming to deliver goods to Crosby's and other businesses in town go much faster. And I know this because I live at 90 Pine Street, and just down the street from me is the radar speed limit sign, which clearly displays how fast these trucks are going. And they're going a lot faster than 30 miles an hour. So raising the speed limit to 30 and doing nothing about enforcement is not going to solve our problem. The street may be need to be narrow. We may need to, to put in bike lanes. We may have to do a lot of things. But right now, the speed limit is too low. 25 would be appropriate. But unless the police start doing their job and going after the trucks, particularly dump trucks, and construction vehicles that go a lot faster past my house because I'm out there in the morning putting out my flag, looking around, and if I had a radar gun, I'll bet you they're going a lot faster, and the sign says they are. So if the police would simply enforce the law, it would be much better. I know we have to do a lot of other things, but they're down the road. Right now, we have to deal with the speed limit. What's it going to take? A child to be struck by a large truck before we open our eyes and take action. Thank you. Okay, and Jim, would you please um, state your address? Certainly. I live at 90 Pine Street, and my name is James Dietrich, and I've been a resident of this town since 2008. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Jim. Um, Greg, there's a comment in the chat. <laughs> You see that? Where I'm on Pine Street. Lower Pine Street. It happened. Ah, it's from, okay. Late 2017, early 2018. The minute I moved here, I'm down. All right. It's from Mark. It's about um, just the, the speed limit. Re, um, I think reiterating what he told us. So, let me see, how do I close this out now? There we go. Um, Mark, did you want to um, make any comments? Uh, no, just uh, to reiterate what I was talking about before, our, our uh, traffic and speed enforcement is up all over town. I can't specifically say um, Pine Street, but I'll make sure to relay that to the midnight shift and the eight to four shift early in the morning from Mr. Diedrich. Okay, thank you, Mark. Yeah, when I'm usually when I'm leaving, I, I'm I'm aware of the trucks going a lot more quickly as well, and just just traffic in general. People, general people trying to 
get where they feel they have to be more expeditiously than probably is necessary. And I, I will say, you know, one person's 24 to 26 or, or perceived 30 or so safe speed, still not the speed limit. So what might seem safe for one person is not always across the board. So Sarah Mellis has her hand up. Okay, I'll go to um, Mr. Cowman. How many seconds difference does it make going from Pleasant to uh, <laughs> the end of the street at 20 miles an hour versus 30 miles an hour? Exactly. 42. So we're saving 42 seconds by going 30 miles an hour versus 20. Yep. If that's worth it, bump it up. Uh, Sarah Mellish. Yes, I just want to say that I think 20 miles an hour is way too slow. I think it's so slow that I become a distracted driver. Instead of paying attention to what I'm doing, I'm looking around because I'm going so slow. So I think an increase to 25 miles an hour makes an enormous amount of sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Saunders, unmute yourself, please, and state your name and address. <coughs> thank you, David Saunders, 58 Pleasant Street. Uh, thank you, Terry, for your presentation. Um, I would reiterate what I think is pretty clear that the design of Pine Street is in complete misalignment with the posted speed limit. That being said, I'm not sure that increasing the speed limit is the <coughs> solution to the problem. Um, uh, particularly, as been mentioned, with a new field being built and conversation, hopefully with the DPW, an expectation or uh, an invitation for them to pull together some possible solutions. I guess I'm I'm just not sure what problem we're trying to solve right now by increasing the speed limit by five miles an hour in that very limited area of town when there are significant changes to that. Upper Pine Street area that they're going to be put in place, and we're talking about maybe a bike lane, and we're talking about maybe changing on street parking, and all that. It feels to me like we're trying to um, accommodate drivers who wish to drive beyond the speed limit um, at the risk of increasing the danger uh, on that side of town, as Terry, I think, uh, demonstrated with the statistics that he shared. So it feels to me like if we are going to ask the DPW to pull together some possible ideas for how to address the situation, which it might include narrowing the street, adding a protected bike lane, that it would seem to me that we should just table the idea of increasing the speed limit until we have a better understanding of what we would like to do with that part of town writ large. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead and lower your hand. And um, Sandy, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and state your name and address, please. Great. Um, Sandy Rogers, 82 Old Essex Road. I want to reiterate something that Jim said, and it happens not only on Pine Street, it happens on Pleasant Street, it happens on many streets in town, is that the, the trucks are actually one of the biggest issues, and that includes um, some of the, the landscaping type trucks. That, that includes a lot the the delivery trucks. Um, if there's something that can be done to speak with some of the larger uh, providers, UPS, Prime, any of the um, sort of, sort of the, the worker trucks around town, if there's something that we can do to reinforce, um, send something to the heads of their companies around the, the issue of speed, that that would be a big issue. I agree there needs to be a little bit more enforcement um, in, in different places, but it's hard to be everywhere all at once. Um, I agree with what is being said that there should be um, sort of look at the whole design of, of streets and it needs to go beyond Pine Street. Um, I think that, you know, if Pleasant is 25, if some smaller streets are 30, even, you know, <laughs> looser than, than, than 
Pleasant, I, I mean, Pleasant um, is 25 and Pine is 20. And I, I think there needs to be some consistency um, because if there's not consistency um, to some degree, then I think there are many of the drivers that come into town, and especially business drivers that um, frequent it, um, they just don't pay attention anymore. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, any other comments? I just have one. I wanted to um, reiterate what Sarah said about the distracted driving. Um, that's part of the reason why I, I am advocating for, in that small stretch of pine, increasing it from 20 to 25. I can't drive that slowly. So what I found myself doing to stay within the speed limit is I use my car's cruise control. I never use my car's cruise control except on speed <laughs> in order to stay within the speed limit. That's the, and I, and I did that for safety reasons, so she made me think of that. I found myself staring at the speedometer instead of looking at the street because I, I found myself going over the speed limit all the time. So I finally decided to put the cruise control on, and now I'm within the speed limit, but that's the only way I can do it. It's just too slow in that one little section for, for my taste. Also, I just for my ability, I'll say. <laughs> the, uh, I think parcel deliveries actually are going to slow down traffic because they're looking for addresses. I don't think that that's going to be impacting speed at all. I don't think these, the uh, UPS driver or Amazon is flying down Pine Street. <coughs> I don't think he's slowing down looking for an address. So I, I think that's All right. Um, Jim, you'll be our last comment, and then we will finish up this discussion. <coughs> So go ahead. I, can't I, I think the previous speakers, David and Sandy, made very good points. Um, raising the speed limit from 20 to 25 is not going to cause a bigger problem. Uh, and if we extended the 25 all the way to Pleasant Street, it would not create more of a problem. Uh, as I've said before, it's the trucks and the lack of enforcement on the trucks. And until the police step up and start enforcing it, whether it's 25, 30, 35, whatever, <laughs> we will have a problem. Widening the road, dealing with the street, putting in bike lanes, those are all down the road and they're all good suggestions. But as I said, we have a problem with trucks going too fast on Pine Street, early in the morning particularly because they're making deliveries. And if we don't enforce it, it won't have, it won't stop. If we start enforcing it, it will stop because nobody wants to pay tickets and have their insurance rate go up. Thank you very much, and I'll unmute myself. Thank you, Jim. Um, Debbie, do you need an address? Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. I move that we accept the. Suggestion of the police department and change the speed limit um, to 25 on the section of Pine Street between Woodholm Road approximately and Pleasant Street. Okay. Friendly amendment? And that concurrent with changing the speed limit, we monitor the speed on the road. Friendly amendment. Mm -hmm. um, the the change between twenty and twenty five is a little bit beyond pleasant. So if you if you only change yeah. the speed limit to pleasant, okay. it's going to drop down so, to twenty again. And that that it be twenty five from Woodhull to um, the the right. section seventy five to the existing twenty five to the existing twenty five. It might be easier just to say to establish the safety zone. Okay. So what you're doing is shortening the safety zone. Let me try it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had a motion and a second. Okay. So we either have to go through no. and say no, or you do the friendly amendment. How do, okay, we, the friendly amendment replaces all of the previous, previous suggestions with 
reducing the size of the safety zone from to extend from the intersection of Central Street and extending north by, northward a, a quarter of a mile. To, to, to Woodholm. To begin. To approximately Woodholm. To approximately Woodholm. To begin the safety zone at Central Street on Pine at, on the safety zone on Pine Street to extend from <coughs> Central Street for a quarter of a mile to approximately Woodholm Street. And reverting the rest and reverting the rest to, 20, to 25 miles an hour. 25 miles an hour. You accept the friendly amendment? Yeah, sure. Brian, <laughs> you sure. accept? I'm not okay. <laughs> Debbie, do you have that? I'll, I'll listen to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moved by Ann Harrison, seconded by Brian Solacy. Roll call vote. John Round? I'll accept all of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brian Solacy? Yes. Kathy Bellotta? Yes. Ian Harrison? Yes. And Becky Jakes votes no. So four, four, one against. And, and, and could we suggest to whoever does speed monitoring that they, when they change the signs, they also set up speed monitoring for that session and report back to us at our next meeting. And in addition to that, um, as Kathy has stated, uh, for the DPW to bring some comprehensive suggestions. Um, do we want that at the 19th? Or do we want to give them a little more time? Do it after the January? OK. First meeting in January? Or second meeting? How about first? Let's aim for the first. OK. Gentlemen, thank you. Great to see all the person. <laughs> nice to see you all. Say hi to Ann. <laughs> okay, so we will come back. First meeting in January. And I have derailed. We're a little bit behind here. All right, so. Uh, discussion items, the zone, MBTA zoning. <coughs> Greg, do you want to go ahead? And... Um, sure. What, um, or sorry, a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, Why don't I, um, high level, sure. take something out and then ask Greg to review the details, if I may. Um, so after attending the last planning board meeting and also... Uh, Ann had sent me some great information on uh, getting up to speed on the MBTA zoning requirements um, because that's uh, the goal we're working together. Um, it, it felt to me like um, there's so much work to be done and it might be a good discussion to have to really clarify who's accountable for what. Um, and at the planning board meeting, I made some specific comments around um, a possible three-step process for, for moving forward. Um, ultimately, whatever we decide to do or not do, those decisions are made at town meeting. So the way I understand it is the, the board's role here, both the planning board and the select board, our job is to collect data and bring <coughs> options to the residents so they can make their decision. Yes, and um, personally, I don't feel like any of us have a well-documented understanding of the current state, meaning based on the current 40A law and the, um, the additional guidance we received during the summertime, how close are we to complying? How far away or how close are we to actually complying? I feel like that's the first order of business. Um, and then I think the planning board needs to take the lead on what are the options for coming, becoming compliant. And you know they could suggest <coughs> small zoning changes that might get us compliant and the town could still say no. So right. then I see the select board's accountability as partnering with the finance committee to understand the financials. What's the contingency plan? If we can't get any zoning changes approved, we've still got 
things to pay for. So that's kind of how, at a very, very high level, um, I thought the planning team might be able to you know, take the lead on some things, the select board on others. And then I sent Greg a draft, um, it's called the RACI chart. It's just a tool to try and have a discussion. It's not comprehensive. It's not meant to dot every I and every you know cross every T, but it's a basis for having a discussion so we could go through a high-level process and say this person or this group is taking the lead on that, and then the final mm -hmm. approver is this board, and just, just kind of have a high-level discussion, and then we divvy up the work and go forward. That was, that was the thinking. So Greg did a great job of taking my chicken scratches on a spreadsheet and, and, and fleshing out a, um, a proposed set of accountabilities and responsibilities. Good, and I, I, I think that's um, what pretty much everyone in town would like to hear the plan being. Anne? Um, I, I have trouble with the accountability being any place other than the select board for any of these. Oh, okay. Okay. The town administrator is certainly a resource and should come up with, but it's it's the select board that makes the decision step by step. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the planning board comes up with it, but the ultimate answer to who, what goes in front of the town and how we present it mm -hmm. is ours. Okay. And that was my my first reaction. Um, I think we need to discuss whether there are alternatives, that, um, as, as you saw, in if you take um, the, the half-mile circle mm -hmm. and, and you put in the flood zones, mm -hmm. the historic districts, um, parks, schools. Harbor. Water. Harbor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they've Water. already Water. given us a discount. They've <laughs> <laughs> given us a discount. They, but but there, there aren't many places, and, and yes, we have isolated developments that are 15 units per acre, but they're isolated. It's not a 14, mm -hmm. you, you, there isn't, yes. Mm -hmm. There's 14, 15 acres on Spire Rock Hill. There's space over on Upper um, Upper Masconomo Street, Masconomo Street, going to the right as you go to the beach. Those are not necessarily neighborhoods. I mean, maybe we could put an overlay district over them. But, but well, it doesn't have to be uh, undeveloped land. I mean, it, it right. could it could consist of existing single family homes. And um, most of that is in the historic district. Or flood. I'm thinking some of your. So, so I, I, I just feel like we're getting down into the weeds, weeds a little, <laughs> little bit. And but, so to but, Anne's point, like you're saying, so that's good. That the chart served its purpose because because right. you've got some great points about who should be accountable. My question. I have a question regarding who's going to do the heavy lifting of. I still think number one is very important: understanding the current state. And would that not be something that our interim town planner could yes. do the heavy lifting and then present to us? Yes. Is that a fair statement? Yes, and there's some uh, assistance that the state can provide with that. They, they're doing some baseline <coughs> data as well. So the town planner does that with Greg's oversight, and then it goes where? It goes to us. So that's the, do, you, do we feel that the planning board would disagree with that. And then that's the reason I'm, I'm poking at this discussion because when I listened in on the planning board meeting, I, I think they have a desire to engage and, and, and. I would like to hear from them. I mean, th that's, that's the, you know, land use is their purview yes. and I would like to hear what they have to say. I, I, I need to hear from the planning board and also the town planner. Yep. I mean, we're sitting here, I think most of us have a general knowledge of what's going on here, but I can't go through this town lot by lot and say, all right, what's in compliance, what's mm -hmm. not, where are their opportunities, where are they not? And I understand that the town planner is new and probably doesn't know the town as well as she we do. She grew up here. She grew up here. Oh, that's right. She did. All right. <laughs> She's got no excuse. I am worried about the timeline here because all of this has right. to happen. Yeah. 
by January 31st. No, just no, 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 no. For the application, the app, the application yeah, does no. that you're you're going to move ahead. But nevertheless, yeah, another year, and you still really have to have a lot of that detail yeah. in place <laughs> to know where the general compliance issue is going to go. And I understand you just have to have a plan to go, but that's not saying you are agreeing to this or not agreeing to it. You just have to have some sort of a general roadmap. And we need that detail pretty fast. I think the question is, what does a draft application look like? It's, it's pretty straightforward. They want you to give a general timeline that shows that you're engaging the public, that you're pursuing options, that you're holding public forums and ultimately hearings, mm -hmm. and that you have a timeline that shows a vote prior to December of 2024. So it's not a hard application to put together. Obviously, all the details are in, the, in that two-year process of but, but out. Basically, the application says we are going to pursue or look into it. Looking at it. We're going to look into it. Yeah. We have no That's idea it. what It's not about. a commitment. Right. It's not a commitment. Yeah. Anne, so, what did you want to say? So it's a, it's a commitment to look into it. <laughs> but it's not a commitment to adopt. Just agreeing to <clears throat> to fill out that application is going to make us unpopular with a group in town. It will make you, yes, I agree with that. Um, Agreed. I guess we can live with that. Um, I. I have a very hard time. See, if we have to have the town meeting in this, by, do we really want to have a town meeting in December? No, I would do it a fall town meeting, mm -hmm. you know, okay. November time frame. Okay. So we have 22 years. months by the time you get this underway. To convince the town. Well, no, 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 We want so, to find out if it's viable. That's so, what so, so, right. This is, I, I think that in order to, we're going to have to have public hearings, right? Uh -huh. And in order to have a public hearing, my recommendation would be we have zoning su change suggestions and financial contingency plan, mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. And and so in order to do both, my suggestion is we divvy up the work. <laughs> That's all. Because yeah. um, we have to have the side we, by side. We've got to have a side by side. <coughs> and if the planning board focused on working with the town planner on options, mm -hmm. you know, for getting compliant, it, it, maybe we're ninety five percent compliant, and it's just a little tweak here or there. You know, who knows? We don't we don't have the data. But then um, we also find out. Okay, if we don't do this, how how do we propose to pay right. for a lot of big 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 things that are coming? So you know, I mean, it's not to say it can't be done. Absolutely, but these are the side by sides you're right. talking about. That, that's my main suggestion. As part yep. of this document that we're going to submit <coughs> in January, we I think we have to put in public hearings, right, As, yes. in that yes. timeline. Mm -hmm. yes. And my suggestion is we we do both the zoning options, the current state. Zoning options and financial contingency plan before we have a public hearing because they're going to ask about all those things anyway. You know, and, and if we're not. So, so here we are know. right now. So, uh -huh. our next steps for this what are, are our next steps? I'd like to suggest a side step. Yep. That we pay attention to other open town meeting towns and what they are doing. Um, because it, it, as the Globe article said, this is something uh, we may be able to yeah. read it. We yeah. may be able to push back on. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And, and I think we should be thinking about what other towns are doing to push back. Yeah. Well, concurrently. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. And, and, and 100% so, agree. Yeah. I want to look at a, uh, a, a regional plan, you know, a Cape Ann plan. Uh, you know, work with our partners along, uh, you know, the other three towns, cities and towns, and 
look at from a regional approach. And that all happens concurrently over the course of the next 22 months. Yep. So I'm hearing, if I just take some notes here, what I'm hearing is four things, well, five things. So five basic deliverables. One is, I still think it's understand current state. How compliant, how close are we to being compliant? Then um, there's number two would be proposed zoning changes to get compliant. Number three would be financial contingency if we're not compliant. Number four would be options for pushing back and um, uh, against the, the law to period. And number five would be a regional option. Yeah. I think four or five are almost that would almost be well, hand in hand. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not because necessarily. Because this is situation is quite different from ours. I think yeah. I look at Rockport or something. You know. Rockport, and we have, and, and Rockport has already got sued about ours. So, what's the left of them? The residents, <laughs> right. So, I, charge. yes. Five of, did yeah. I get them? I think yep. so. I think those are, and, and so when we're, okay, we're talking about potential the five options where do we go right now with those it's not it's five actions five, five actions. actions yeah five actions so number one current state let's just talk that the yep. town planner she can do that and get us an assessment of the current state how close we are to complying do we have a, an idea by when she can finish that the top of my head, I would say by the end of January. Okay, so end of January, and we have to submit the plan by the end of January. This is part of this is part of the well, plan. We just includes. outlined the five deliverables right. that can be our plan. Right. right. We, we don't, don't have, have to, to know. Have to do it by the then. Just we don't have to complete me. them by the end of January. We're just going to put these deliverables in the plan with with dates. Right. And public hearings and. As part of that, Greg, can she also identify? sites within this half mile radius that are currently uh, available so that that's that should be the current state right. well, well yes. where do we yeah, already comply a, where are we and what can we do because it's she's matching she's not matching what's been built to the law she's matching what the zoning is to the law mm -hmm. so it could be an empty piece of land as long as it's zoned to match the law, then we're in compliance, but, right? But this law yeah. require, is looking for an extra, what, 350 units, is that correct? Not no, necessarily no, no. extra, that's in total. So that's the difference. They're not saying in to it extra. They, uh, what's already built that fits, fits that density will count? Yeah. All right, well, I'm, uh, I'm very Nothing interested in that assessment. <coughs> right. Nothing has to be... If, if you already where, meet it. Right, on and this is where... Hand, we have absolutely no zones in town with multi-family housing by right. By right. None. Uh, That's, it's, well, you have... The general district is all still district. the three family. Is, you have, yes, we do. We have three we units do. per... Up to three units. Three, three units. units. But, but in our zoning law, three units is listed I'll get as you three units see, Sarah. and not as multi-family. In the definitions in our zoning. So, so this is probably a good time to ask the town planner to clarify these right. details rather than us trying to do it by code. Right. Um, Sarah, you had a comment about that? Yes. So currently the, the zoning density in the general district is three units per lot. And the lot size needs to be 6,000 square feet. The zoning could be changed to reflect the size of a lot, which would easily comply. But that's rather changing than, it. We're t if we're talking about three current. units per lot, if it's a 6,000 square, uh, 12,000 square foot lot, it could be six units. So, so I think that there's flexibility there, and we just need to look at the size of the lots and what we already allow. Thank and you. And what we could tweak to make it qualified. Okay, good. Thank you, Sarah. That's very helpful. <coughs> All right, so um, number two, 
who is that? Are we going to ask the planning board to look at that? The, pl the changes to comply? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, in fairness to the planning board, that's the one deliverable or action that may require a good understanding of the current state. So um, yeah. that deliverable would be after the end of January be subsequent. Because, right. because there's a dependency there. The other items are not dependent on understanding the current state. Of, of the, the zoning. We can come up with financial contingency plans. We can discuss how, how would we push back legally because um, other towns are already doing that. Um, not sure if a region, we could probably start discussions on a regional approach. Um, so I think the only really big dependency here in the plan is the, that I don't know how much work the planning board can do without understanding that current state. So it, it may very well make sense to have you know, sort of a strategy session with the right. planning board. Yes. And then the this, right. And whether that going forward, does this um, is this best handled by a special task force? Is it you know is it done by the planning board? Again, that's a discussion I think that would be productive. Mm -hmm. So first, first is we we, we want to hear from Betsy. Yep. We can get that information by the end of January. Um, the financial contingencies. So is that something we could discuss briefly next week at our meeting with FinCom? I mean, that's something that I would think we'd rely quite a bit on FinCom to help us understand what are the potential expenses over the next five years or whatever, however longer mm -hmm. period of time that where we might um, you know need state funding or is or just what's the other ap approach we could take yeah probably take a, a longer time horizon in five years just because this is yeah. whatever term. it is 30 mm -hmm. what it, um, you know yeah. we have a 20 year time horizon or something yeah um, but the primary um, primary funding is mm -hmm. relates to uh, to dredging to um, Roads, water utility right. yeah. upgrades, those are the two biggest ones. Mm -hmm. So, so um, DPW. So, what you're saying, our town, you might need to provide the what we would need to spend money on, and FinCom right. So that helps in, with the yeah, approach, pretty, financial yeah. approach. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? And it ties in well with what we're putting together anyways for, right. the, for the budget yeah. and capital planning and, and a 20 year look yeah. ahead. So if we can tie those into the same discussions then reduce the need for separate meetings or right. yeah. that okay. sounds great. So that'll be December 12th, 15th. Thank you. So we can have that chat on the 15th. Sam was taking notes and sure. She's Sarah's got her hand up. Sarah's taking notes anyways, I'm sure. Sarah, did you have another comment? Yeah, I was going to volunteer to work with the town planner to figure out the data and work on this. I don't have the 40B, so I have time now. In your spare time. She's got nothing else to do now. Yeah, but guess what, Sarah? If you would like me to do that, season. I'm happy to work with her. Sarah oh, no, Mellish. No, 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 she's awkward. Let her go. <laughs> it, it seems the town planner is, is, is a very key person. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yes. Because the planning yes. board is going to turn to her. Mm -hmm. Right. For All right. And Sarah has the time. But we need to, to figure out the data and the options. And I think the planning board will, would want options presented to them. I think the sound is experience Thank you. With also the zoning board. That's right. As an ABA lead, I think that's absolutely. Absolutely. This is perfect absolutely. Okay. Uh, so then the, the, the pushback. Whoops. Um, do. Uh, and. Thoughts on that one? <coughs> I 
I thought that was something that someone who was connected sure. with other town administrators might. Have. Yeah, but this will clearly require a lot of public forums and yeah, yeah. and uh, discussions. And, and I, I think people express like, their opinions after we are able to assemble some basic facts that we can distribute. I was thinking about pushback against the state regulation. Yes. Right. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 And, and I thought that you might be in a better position to contact other towns. Yes. No, I can. I can monitor what, what other communities are doing. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I. Yeah. So. And we can all do read. I mean, uh, we should be doing reading anyway, so. And a subset of that would obviously talking to your counterparts here in Cape Ann. Yeah. Okay, and see if there's an appetite to do something on a regional basis. Yeah. All right. So then the question would be timing on those last two items. Right. Pushback option and regional discussion. I think those are ongoing for the next mm -hmm. 12 plus months. <laughs> um, okay, so let me rephrase. Update. When, yeah, when do we want to get an update? Yeah. yeah. Um, you think it's... Yeah, I think you give sort of quarterly updates on, on what's So happening. actually, that's a, that's a good question. So let's talk higher level maybe. Um, how many public forums do we think we need? So if we know that we are yep. kind of work yep. backwards from the schedule, so let's say September or November of 2024 is when we have to have our final town meeting if we decide to go forward with any changes, budget or zoning. Uh, backtrack from that in 2024, how many public hearings would you want to have in 2024? I suspect we would want to have at least one in 2023. Right. So maybe we kind of backtrack. Well, Schedule backwards, right? <laughs> Probably in the fall of 23, we'd have enough information mm -hmm. to bring to a town forum. So I, I don't think we could reasonably have a good amount of information prior to that. Sometime so that's one. Months, months. So public hearing, first public hearing, fall of 2023? In the fall of 23, so as Brian's about 10 months. Nine, ten, and then um, depending on how close we want to get to the next town meeting, and then I would say at least two more mm -hmm. in in twenty four, and and depending on how much information comes back and which direction it looks like people are inclined and we think would be the better option. What do you think? Does that sound, Ann? Does that sound reasonable, or do you think we might? So I think it may require a different approach from the standard public forums. I think and we don't need to solve that tonight. Right. But I, I think we <coughs> should think about um, a series of different outreach efforts, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. starting with. First, we have to assemble some basic data and, and basic summaries of what the law is requiring, et cetera. Right. But we basically create you know, a mini roadshow <laughs> that we take to as many different gatherings as we can. But that are actual give and take. Yes. So that so they're, they're discussions. Right. They're not right. they're not hearings. Right. They are forums or public discussion right. groups. Right. Um, that could be from you know a handful of people to a room of four. Visiting the Rotary, visiting exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, you know, sort of along the lines of, of the um, heart and soul mm -hmm. approach mm -hmm. um, that we've kicked around a little bit. Um, so, our, if if any zoning changes are proposed, is it required that there be an actual public yes. hearing? Right. Yes. Okay. When we get to that stage, yes. Okay. So that so those may be later in 2020. And that's more what I'm thinking yes. when I'm saying when I'm saying a, a formal a public. Correct. A formal no, I understand. I, we need both. Yes, absolutely. Yes, need both. I agree. It's, it seems that there are so many different scenarios 
mm-hmm. that you can come up with it. I mean, you got the compliant or non-compliant. Mm-hmm. And if you go compliant, well, okay, there are so many different scenarios. There can be zoning scenario A, B, C. You really have to start, if you don't present people with something, it's going to be all over the place. Right. I agree. Right. That's so you've got to come out with maybe just two in that area. And then if you say, okay, we're, we're, we're not going to comply, then you've got a bunch of different financial scenarios. You're going to jack up taxes. You're just going to do, the, you know, delay certain things. And there are some things you can't delay. I mean, you have to have two or three scenarios for that. And they have to be laid out. Otherwise, again, you're going to be all over the place. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you go into your first forum, it seems <coughs> to me you've got to have, like, four scenarios. Two in the compliance and two not. And, uh, unless, well, I'm, we're going to learn a lot more in the next month or two, and maybe, right. maybe that'll... So, so I think that's when we figure it out. But, yeah. once we have a better but, idea. but you have to look, the, the forms have to have multiple scenarios, whichever yes. way it's going, uh, a, a couple for people to look at. I think as Greg pointed out, we don't have to make that decision tonight. We no. don't have to make a decision, no. but we do have to put enough detail on the action plan right. so that it's accepted by the state. So... If we target our first public outreach, whatever we want to call it, spring of 2023, yes. that, yeah. would that be okay? Because then by January, we'll have the, the <coughs> current state well-defined yep. Um, yep. and a couple of options probably. So we, we need to move forward somehow. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, because if the planning board gets going on the, yep. the potential options, once we hear back from Betsy and Sarah, that by the spring, we'll have some. Okay. Is that reasonable given the preparation needed for town meeting? I'm just <coughs> I'm asking for a friend. Uh, <laughs> that, that's one of the reasons I'm really uh, working yes. hard at the timing because. I say we do it after town meeting. Right, so it's something that would get underway. You know, in, right. in the May time frame. It's yes. going to happen before. It's going to so happen before, before the summer. summer. It's going to yes. happen before yes. summer. I, I agree. Okay. Okay. So sort the of targeting May is yeah. in my mind. Yeah. It, you know, so town meeting is 1st of April. So, so beginning of May. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Greg, it, do, you, do you feel we've had enough discussion around key milestones to fill out that form. Hi, Jeremy, could you draft something maybe for us to come back and look at again yes. before you fill out the form? Yes. Um, and also maybe feedback from the planning board or a town planner, obviously, et cetera. But we want enough detail that it's reasonable and accepted, but not so much detail that we're committing to Absolutely. one thing Well, it's not right. a commitment anyway, right. which okay. is, so, that's... Um, we, we are committing to some things. I mean, if, we, if we give them a timeline that says when our hearing, when we're going to have hearings... This is, if we're going to go forward, these are the steps we will take, if we choose to go forward. So let me ask you this, if at some point in the... 22 month period, we decide, you know, something this is not an avenue we're going to pursue. Right. Okay, to your point, right. to your point, then when is the when, out? Then, then we go. But we still have to do the work on the financials <laughs> because we can't say no, we're not going to comply unless we fully under, you know, no have some understanding. I mean, we're not committing to, uh, you know, if all of a sudden there's a, this, we have looked at all the, the financial aspects of it, we listened to the town folk. Yeah. And we've decided as a community, we're not going to pursue this. So, stop it. so Greg, stop. What, what is our drop dead date for, for saying no? Do we have December of 2020? It is, tw- that's I'm just the, so we're for, all clear, right? Yeah, okay. and, and for all of these, does this form require dates other than we want an answer <laughs> in December 2024? No, that's just so, so really, you can just say, here's the process we're kind of go through, okay. spring, and spring, we're not going to put any dates on any of this stuff. It, it's going to be pretty general. Right. Fine. Okay. Well, it's, but we're not we're also, making, yeah. so we can't be faulted for failing to make adequate progress on yeah. what we've right. committed to. They're not going to judge you until the until until December 20th. Right. They're going to let, they're going to wait until they hear from either a yes or the deadline has come. 
That's what they're looking for. There's no micromanagement there, I'm guessing, right? No. We only need a timeline for our, ourselves to keep ourselves on track so we don't... Okay, I'm going to yeah. try to close up this this little... Are we, are we clear on where we're going at this point, Greg? I, I will work with Betsy, and we'll put together a draft of the action plan, which will be shared with both you and the planning board. Um, get your feedback either at your next meeting or your first meeting in January. And then you'll be ready to submit it by the end of January. So hope, and then Betsy and Sarah, who volunteered to help out. In January, we'll get start that, that analysis yes. of current. Yes. Hopefully to be done by the end of January. OK, great. Awesome. And then on the 15th, we can talk a bit about the financial contingencies. We can broach that on the 15th. Yes. OK. Ron has a question. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Ron. Unmute and lower your hand and jump on in. Or not. Or not. You might. Okay. Is there something else in the chat? Uh, no, those are old. Okay. All right. Um, moving on to goals, governance, improvements. Action item tracking. Um, do we have, is there a form that, that, that we were going to look at for this? Is in the package? Yeah, there's a spreadsheet in the, <laughs> two things in, yep. the, in the packet. One was a yeah, template. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Hi, Ron. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we can hear you now. I don't think he can hear us. Uh -oh. um, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but uh, we have that on the agenda for our meeting, and uh, we do agree with uh, going with uh, Betsy's recommendations. And I'd like to add a planning board member to the discussion with Sarah and Becky. Betsy. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Yes, thank you. Pebble? Yep. Um, also, I don't think it has to be continuous to the half mile radius. I think we can go beyond that. Correct. Uh, Greg may Correct. confirm that. Mm -hmm. But some of it has to be. Some, some has to be. 14.8 acres, roughly. Um, so some of it has to be within the half mile, but Roughly. not all. The majority can be outside. They have a run-on sentence, yeah. <laughs> I do edit them. Okay, is... Um... Thank you, Ron. We still have Ron? Thanks. Oh, there you are. I don't know if we ever had him. <laughs> okay. Anything else, Ron? Uh, no. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have our um, sample agenda draft. Um, are we? It was this to change from the current form that we're using. Is that the Thought? So, suggestion here was that as part of the chair's opening remarks, that there would be an update on the action items. Yes. Um, I, I personally don't think we need to list it in the agenda. I think it's a, a sheet that would be added to the packet. Um, I agree. Just, yeah. I, I just think it's going to make the agenda heading a little busy and, and, yeah. and yeah. cumbersome. Um, but, but I think it's important think to have that as as the first page in your packet after the agenda, um, and that it, yep. it spells out, you know, what the items, what the items were, and what the what the next step is or has been, and what's what's the status. So this would be an addendum to the ag agenda. Correct, basically. Or rather than addendum to the agenda, it's page one of the packet. So it's not necessarily. Doesn't have to be printed with the agenda. 
So I think the, so Susan and I worked on this with Greg, and I think the um, underlying principle is that at the beginning, the, the action item tracking spreadsheet that's on the second page here, um, that's a living document, and... Really small. Yeah. yeah. yeah pretty small. <laughs> you're, you're correct, Greg. Right, yeah, you, you don't have to put the action items in the agenda, but the action items are used to formulate the agenda items, right? Because you yep. don't want to yep. forget to do that. Yep. And I, I believe Susan was suggesting that at the beginning of the meeting, Correct. after the chairman's report, we review outstanding actions. So you don't have to have them in the agenda. You can just refer to the spreadsheet. Right. It's the first mm -hmm. item in the package. That way everybody can give an update on their actions. And we don't lose track and things don't fall through. That is such a good idea. And, and, then well, and then at the very end of the meeting, yep. any new action items right. would be summarized. Right. Get added on to that. Good. So. And then, yeah, so Debbie put together this, this spreadsheet here, um, and yep. she, can, she can maintain that. Could we, could we Take a have it in, in bigger print? Yeah, or absolutely. Or absolutely. Or absolutely. No, that was, that was yes. my fault. Yeah. That, that was my fault. Yes. I tried to shrink it down to a page, and I didn't shrink <laughs> it properly. <laughs> and Debbie, just one other suggestion I had sent to Susan was to, um, on the, sp the spreadsheet up at the top, should have an as of date. Mm -hmm. To reflect the last time it was updated, because based on this, um, the sample that's here, it looks like this was updated uh, November 11th, right? So you want to have an as of date, and that way it's clear. Um, but it's got all the right information in there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think that will be. So, so then the question would be if we agreed to use this. Um, have this change in our process, uh, Debbie, do, do you need some help filling it up? Because there's stuff that's not here. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is this what you have captured based on reviewing? It's just what I came up with just for okay. the last couple, just to think about it. So there is definitely more. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely <laughs> put them down. I would love the help. Okay. All right. So then maybe... We can all take the action to send Debbie any outstanding actions that we know of. Okay, excellent. Right. Thank you. By today's Monday, can we do this um, by next Monday? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Um. I see where the owner is. Um. That would be 15, 14, 13. Oh my God. Yeah. Just add, add seven. <laughs> How many fingers do I have? Uh, 12? Yeah. Should be 12. Yeah. The history version, <laughs> I can do that one. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, are we good on that? So the agenda will look more like. A regular agenda. Yes. It, 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 it's, except yes. that the first item after where it now says tax classification hearing, it would be um, next steps or. Well, so I would do it as part of the chairman's report. No. Yeah. yeah. Be it's, it'll, 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 it's just yeah. part of the chairman's report. I, I, I understand that, I okay. think. It's part of the chairman's report. It won't and be he, listed on and this. It's in the packet. Yes. Okay. Fine. We can say chairman's report and action item update. Mm -hmm. okay. Debbie, are you, you going to be maintaining this like on our SharePoint um, repository or? So we can. We haven't, we haven't talked about that as a group, no. but we certainly could establish. It would be nice if this was on our SharePoint and as part of the package, you just have a link there to the document as well. I mean, certainly I've, I think it's great to include it in the package, but if we don't have a meeting for three weeks and Debbie adds some actions, et cetera, it'd be nice just to go be able to easily get to that living document wherever it right. is. But I do think it should be in Absolutely. the yes. packet as well. Yep. Yeah. But yeah. But SharePoint is good because we'll come up with something. Oh, I wonder what's going on with this. 
Yep. And you don't want to send it out if you, in fact, go on there and say, oh, Debbie's already got it on there. I don't have to worry about it. Right. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, <coughs> I don't like having to poll to go to SharePoint every day and see what somebody just added. So if you're going to add something, send the email. Mm. Yeah, if you want to just put yes, as long as we're not saying, and give me feedback. <laughs> <laughs> no feedback. No. You look concerned. No. Okay. No. No. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm just mean, listening. <laughs> SharePoint can be set up so that anytime that file is updated, it's it a notification. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that can easily be done and no extra effort on the hand part. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anything else on that topic? Okay, um, unless somebody has a burning desire, we can put liaison updates for next time. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. okay, there is a... Um, the school committee um, mm -hmm. budget meeting, and I think it's in the 14th of December. I don't remember. I think there is a... So there'll be a public... Public um, meeting to present the preliminary budget. Yes. On the, I believe it's the fourteenth. It's the fourteenth. Yes. So Tuesday. Right. Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday the fourteenth. Next Wednesday at seven p.m. <coughs> Thank you. Well, and and since that's half our budget, yep. Yeah. Something might be interested. Uh, what's the date? The fourteenth. Yes. Thank you. So that's in the in the library at the high school, middle high school. And it's available hybrid. Oh, good. What time? Seven. Seven. Okay. Uh, next up, we have consent agenda. Did anybody need anything pulled out of that? I, I have an issue, a minor issue with with the minutes, um, and I've vacillated on bringing it up. Um, according to the minutes, I was supposed to come back with something on the application process, and I was waiting for information on what other towns do, and I, I slipped my mind who was whose action item that was. Too bad you have one of these action item reports. <laughs> But so, I don't want to put together something and then have somebody come back and say, oh, well, that's not what other towns do. So, whoever, and I, I pray that I view this as, as an administration so, action rather than mine. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think we did volunteer to do that. I have not done that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I apologize. Uh, if, you, if you could look in, uh, okay. find out in the end. What was the yeah, topic? We, we can do a, we'll do a quick, quick ask of what others are doing. Um, oh, that was on the, um, okay, it was, was it on the town meeting? No, 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 no it's it was, the appointments policy. Oh, the appointments on, policy. But, yeah, yeah. Um, and we discussed a bunch of things, and I said I would come up with new verbiage, and I think I said I'm only come up with new verbiage after I get information. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Any other amendments to the... Uh, minutes? Any comments or questions on anything else on the consent agenda? So let me just, just, just to run through it, just to understand. Okay, the first one is approval of the minutes. Mm -hmm. And we've had the modification, or the amendments. Um, then we received the resignation letter from Gary, the official resignation letter from Gary Gilbert. Uh, so we now have that vacancy on the planning board, um, which... We so again, we would encourage anyone interested. Yep. And I would certainly submit a letter of interest uh, within the next couple three weeks. We would aim for 
a joint meeting with the planning board come uh, come early January. Should we put something in the cricket? Yes. On the website. Uh -huh. Yep. Uh -huh. Yep. We'll have uh, we'll have um, Tiffany get that out. Okay. So given that the planning board is a rather technical board, of, as we've discussed in the past, um, would you be including some type of expertise requested specifically? Sometimes we don't do that for the other committees, et cetera. Um, I'm just throwing um, it out there. I think the interview yeah. process is pretty... Uh, and the application. Yeah, the application oh, the application has, has that. Okay. And the interview. Yeah. But I mean, I guess well, sometimes in the posting, we're looking for these types of people. Are, right. we looking for, are we looking for an architect? If Gary right. is, an arch is an architect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone with I planning. I, I think someone with general planning. I, I right. hope that anybody who would apply for a position on the planning board would have reason to think that he had planned. Do they have? I think if we're you know, specific, and maybe that would be, in, you know, Greg before Tiffany publishes something in consultation with Ron as to is there a particular skill set, you know, um, not only what Gary is is uh, now, uh, you know, removing from the board, but is there some skill set they wish they had and and they don't? It's a good opportunity to flesh that out. I think. Okay, we had a, um, a proposal to uh, increase the fees uh, at the Chowder House, um, which hasn't really greatly been done in some time. And then the Bike Ped Committee vacancy uh, as well. I didn't follow that at all. The bike pad? Yeah, I know, you need to just go to the last yeah. one. Just the last. So they. they okay. the, the person who's not showing up is Amy. Correct. Is Amy, Amy Coleman. And they haven't been able, able to get a hold of her. Right. It has come to my attention that Jay has yet to take his oath of office. But, but that's that's separate issue. Don't, that's worry, separate. don't worry about that. We're just just go to the very. I know we we, we got so this okay. last one dated the twenty eighth. Oh, okay. The last one dated the. This is the first one. Well, the, yes, the most recent. Just that. That's the most. Thank you. Recent. I was going to ask the same question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I know. It well, was. It's difficult to figure out which is. <coughs> Yeah, I know, we got you, a lot of you, information. Unless you read the dates, you don't realize that they're, this is but life. Basically, this, this most, it's the most recent ask is to note that there is a vac one vacancy on bike ped left by Amy Coleman, who has not been in attendance, nor has she responded so we just need to uh, advert that as well anything for discussion on the consent agenda if not may I have a motion to approve so moved second moved by Ann Harrison seconded by the zippy John round <laughs> Okay. Well, we know it goes 30 miles an hour down Pine Street. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't Just don't follow 29. me. 29. Okay, roll call vote. John Round? Yes. Brian Solisey? Yes. Kathy Bellotta? Yes. Ann Harrison? Yes. Becky Jake says yes. Now we have our town administrator's report. <coughs> okay, so we'll have the um, uh, preliminary budget ready to present to you on the 15th of December. That'll be a joint meeting. With the finance committee, as we uh, discussed earlier, um, so it really marks um, the beginning of the next phase. <laughs> so obviously, there's been a lot of work up until now right. with department heads, sort of one-on-one, -on -one and looking at their requests and trying to balance things out. Um, so we'll put the preliminary budget um, together in the next week and have it ready for you um, for presentation on the 15th, and then it's on to. Uh, you know, line by line reviews and, and discussions on some of the bigger issues that that um, we're, we're facing in that budget. When will we be able to have that? So you'll have the budget in your hands that night. Okay. Um, 
and um, you know, if you if you want it a couple of days ahead of time, yeah, can we? I was going to ask you to get it ahead of time. Certainly do that. Yeah. Yes. Um, please. So, um, so that'll be presented um, as I indicate. Uh, staffing and public safety is probably the biggest issue we're, we're facing with with this budget. So there are some important decisions that will need to be made uh, regarding um, moving forward on staffing numbers for those those three: the harbor, police, and fire. Um, also, if there's time on the fifteenth, it would be helpful if you and the finance committee can. Uh, discuss the ambulance and what your thoughts are about proceeding. As you know, town meeting approved um, money to either repair or replace the old ambulance. Um, so if there's information that you would find particularly helpful. Um, I'd like to know, is there, a, is there an estimate to repair? Have we seen yes. There is one contract. Yep, we'll have that for you. Um, and that'll be part of part of the package. Is there perhaps a, a third route? Um, because I think what the town thinks it's paying for is five minute response time. <coughs> um, and we don't get that when the ambulance is taking patients to the hospital. Right. Um, and Is there is there something that, that isn't a huge ambulance with all the stuff necessary to be in in a fire? And the, the, the current ambulance is is an enormous truck that could get paramedics to a person with enough equipment without without waiting two more years. So <coughs> the, the the problem is what equipment so so those, the big rigs are big because of <coughs> fully equipped for the paramedic services. No, I mean, uh, yes, but some of the stuff around the outside is is fire gear so that the people in the ambulance can go into a fire. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of that is there. But so well, and people like you you're in Beaufort, what do they drive? No, they don't have outsides. Right, Beaufort doesn't respond to fires. I think that's where you're going, right? You're asking, is there another vehicle type yeah, you're option? You're talking about a scaled-down vehicle. Is scaled -down is there a scaled-down vehicle? Yes. vehicle that we could yeah. get sooner for right fighting this right right. right. and 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 and. Right. So let, let's ask that question and yep. find out. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. I haven't even thought of that. Well, I just had a long chat with the fire department. Did you? Oh, two weeks ago. Oh, okay. <coughs> All right. So that'll be again on the 15th, that discussion. Um, uh, governance work continues. Uh, uh, Susan Beckman is meeting with a number of department leaders this week. And so we'll be updating you on that. Um, and then lastly, um, as I think all of you know, Ken Real is uh, retiring from the uh, Chamber, Ch Cape Ann, Greater hey. Cape Ann, uh, Chamber of Commerce. And um, uh, there's a reception for him uh, next week. And it would be uh, very fitting if you were agreeable to signing a, a proclamation honoring his, his work. Uh, so if you're agreeable to that, we can have that ready for your signature. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. And, and remind me, is that a five to seven? Is that what they said with presentation at? 6.30-ish. 6.30. Yeah. <coughs> and that's why we're bumping our meeting to 7.30. Right. The FinCom. Okay. And Brian will present that. So, that's what I had for you this evening. Okie dokie. All right. Any other comments or questions, concerns? Right. If that's nothing, uh, at eight fifty-four, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Wow, that's first. Okay. <laughs> moved by John Round, seconded by Ann Harrison. Roll call vote. Ann Harrison. Yes. Kathy Pilata. Yes. Brian Solacy. Yes. 
John Round? Yes. <coughs> and Becky Jake says yes. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Good night, everybody.